to go right to the Milwaukee Bucks. And I want you to set the scene for us seven and a half, eight years ago. You're buying the team. Why are you buying the team? What thoughts are going in your mind about the team? Take us there. Um, so the reason we initially, I'd always, I'd always wanted to buy a team. Um, you know, the problem was the lack of money. Was it any <laughs> team? Like, a, I mean, a major league team, a baseball, football? No, it was basketball. Basketball team. Always wanted to buy basketball. Always basketball. Um, I mean, as you could tell, I used to play basketball. Yes, right. you could tell. You could be on the scare. You could play center on the scare. Right, that was basketball it. team. So, um, originally, I'd been an investor in the Brooklyn Nets. Right. And then when um, the Bucks became available, part of it was that when we did the analysis on it, you have one thirtieth of the league. So whether you're buying in Milwaukee or you're buying in LA, you have one thirtieth of the TV contract. Right. So we thought at the time, um, Milwaukee was a great market um, in the sense that it was the worst team in the league. So all you could do was go up. Um, I think there were, out of 30 teams, there were 29th or 30th in almost every category, except for beer sales. It's, it's an important thing to understand. I didn't understand that. Uh, but I, I bought a small piece of the New York Mets in 2011, sold it to Steve Cohen, but you, we were getting revenues from MLB.com from the, not MLB, but MLB, which had included .com, TV, yep. and other revenue sources from the whole league. What about the jerseys, though, Mark? Are they also a one you get You get a piece of everything. Everybody's jersey. But the for us, the biggest thing we thought at the time was the TV contract was about $900 million, um, and it was coming due in two years, so we thought it was going to be about double. So we thought the revenue of the team, you know, the national TV contract ends up being about sort of 35%, 40% of your revenue. So we thought, oh, that's great. That's going to double. Um, it should be great. And, um, you know, in two years, this will turn out to be a really good deal. Um, the problem was we were paying at the time the most for any NBA franchise. So it was about $550 million. And but we thought within two years it should be worth like seven hundred million, mm -hmm. and um, the TV contract turned out to be three times what the original one was. So it, that's how it turned out to be a great deal. But you also uh, at that time, correct me if I'm wrong, you were at an older arena. We did. There was some speculation about whether or not you were going to be able to build a new arena in Milwaukee. Yeah. So you should. I mean. If, if you had seen it, there was this training facility, which was in a nunnery. They had a basketball court, and that was the training facility for the Bucks. <coughs> so and when it rained, you had to put buckets on the court. It, it was it was horrible. It really was. So first we had to build a new training facility, and then we had to get land, and we had to raise money um, to build an arena. Um, so we were willing to put up half the money, and we wanted to be partners with the state and the city that they would do the other half. Um, and that's what ended up ultimately happening. Um, but we were able to build a new arena within two years. Yeah, and, and the arena, because I've been there, it's a world-class state-of-the-art arena. It's probably one of the nicer arenas in the country yeah, because of the design and the location in the city. Yeah, it's been fabulous. So I think we've gotten exceptionally lucky in that we were able to do everything in a pretty short amount of time. And then uh, obviously the team has done um, extremely well. S seven years. Uh, we've had other sports manager uh, owners up here. Um, Lou Lamorello. I don't know if you know Lou, but he's GM now at the Islanders. Uh, yep. He once said that it's uh, nine months for a baby. It's 11 months for an elephant. It's seven years for a championship, meaning from the point of ownership to the ability to get it. And you hit it literally right on the number. How'd you do it? Um, well, first, we were really lucky in that when we bought the team, Giannis was already on the team. So, okay, that was so first some year. people may not know who Giannis is. I obviously do. Obviously, MVP, world-class player. He was on the team already, so somebody had drafted him. Yep. And you had him on the team, but he was up for free agency. He was up for free agency last year. Yes. Um, so really all we did was just try to convince him to stay and hope that he was going to stay. 
Um, and Giannis being the individual that he is, loves Milwaukee and wanted to try to win a championship with the team that we had. Um, I think a lot of that is we're, ex- we're extremely lucky in the person that he is, that he, he really feels he wants to do it. Um, he, he didn't want to go to a super team. He felt an obligation to Milwaukee. Um, and that's one of the reasons he stayed. Uh, that and the two hundred and forty million we gave him. But, um, <laughs> well, I I did a small talk with you last year, and uh, obviously you were in negotiations at the time. So we finished the salt talk, and then I I buzzed you on the cell phone, and I said, okay, give me the number that you think you're going to have to pay him to keep him. Kept it private, of course. You told me the number. I fell down, but you paid him that number. Yeah. Why? Well, that's the max you could pay. So it was literally. Because um, the way the NBA works, if somebody's on your team, you have the ability to give them an extra year. So the most any team could offer Giannis was four years. We could give him five years. And those five years, it ends up being about 230, 240. Uh, So you give him the max you're allowed under the rules, which is 35% of the cap. So it's great for him. It's great for us. Um, And then obviously by him staying, and sort of us and the GM actually doing a fabulous job, we were able to win a championship. So we're both sports enthusiasts, and we both watched uh, the owner and then the operational dilemma. What's the owner operational dilemma? The owner wants to be the operator. So they think they know more about XYZ baseball, hockey. They know more about basketball than the operational people. But it seems like the people that lay off and let the – real pros handle it do the best is that true i it depends i mean i think it's i think for us um we're pretty involved we are um you're you're spending quite a bit of money on players so the general manager will pick who he thinks is really good and then comes to us to say here's what i'd like to do are you okay with me spending x um sometimes we are and sometimes we're not I mean, sometimes we'll go, um, let me see your analysis. Let's go through it. Why do you think this player deserves it? The thing about the NBA that's actually fascinating is the two biggest values in the NBA are rookie rookie contracts. Right? I mean, think about it. For the first four years, we paid Giannis, I would say, $3 million a year or something like that. You know, And then your max so contract. They're, they're valuable because you're getting the player at a for relatively years, low price yes. until they go into the free agency. And so those right. are valuable getting them early on. Yeah. And then the max contract, obviously you're going to give someone like Giannis a max contract. Where you get hurt in the NBA is where you'll pay somebody, you know, between 10 and 20 million. And for whatever reason, they're not worth what you paid. So there's the contract, I mean, it's just, if you're paying somebody 10, you hope he's performing at 20. And if you pay uh, what you don't want is you're paying somebody 20 and he's performing as if it's like, you know, what a $5 million player we do. So there's a lot of analytics involved. And, you know, we have to sign sign off on a lot of these things. And so, you know, you're going to sign off on trades. You're going to sign off on things. You give the GM a lot of discretion. Uh, but ultimately, at the end of the day, you've got to say yes or no. Built a great business. Um, how old's your business now, Scott? How old Avenue, is it? Yeah, Avenue Capital. Uh, it's about, we started in 95, so I guess, you know. Oh, 26 years. Yeah, 26, 27 years. Um, and you built a great culture. Tell us about the culture at the Milwaukee Bucks when you got a hold of it and tell us how you, what some changes that you made to the culture. So it's a great question. Um, you know, the first challenge you have when you buy a team or you own a team is um, what's the culture you want? And what I mean by that is, so if you sort of think about it, time when we bought the Bucks, you had, we had the number two draft pick. So we could have picked either Jabari Parker or Joel Embiid. And Joel Embiid is a perennial all-star, could be an MVP can't, uh, player. Um, and the, the only reason, and, you know, so we picked Jabari because Joel had a broken foot. So part of what we wanted to do was on day one, sort of say to everybody, We're here to try and win. We're not here um, to try to keep moving up on the lottery and try to get better draft picks. The goal is we're here to win. We're here to get to the playoffs and sort of build a culture around winning. And it's hard because you've got to do that. 
Whereas I think some teams sort of look at it and say, well, I'm going to keep on trying to get lottery picks. Um, and I want to, I'll get better, but I'll get better in five years. You know, we wanted to get better right away. Um, and you have to get lucky. And we did, but um, I think we built a culture and everybody knew from day one that the goal was we're going to try to win a championship. We're going to try to do everything we can. And we're going to try to bring, bring in all the best, you know, GM, the coach, and do things that are going to help you get there. Okay, so you, you grew up modestly. You know your life story. You're, you're, you are, to me, the epitome of the American dream in so many different ways. You um, built a business, raised a family, and now won an NBA championship. So that was a little bit of the outlier there, but you're, you've done all these great things. But there you were as a kid. And you're idealizing your life. Did you ever buy the Sports Illustrated posters as a kid? Because I had one. I had one of yeah. Lou, I had one of Lou Alcindor. I did the same one with the Milwaukee I mean, yeah. Bucks jersey on. Yeah. He was making the hook shot. Did mm -hmm. you have that one? Yeah, I do. It was it was in your probably right. It was on my my mother's like Carol Brady 1971 paneling. You know the walnut paneling with yes. the sheet rock. The fake know, the fake wood. Fake one. Yeah, yeah right, that's the, the one. Overlay, right. It was, and I I taped it up with scotch tape. Who else right. did you have in the in the bedroom? Oh God, for me, I loved, you know, you, you thought you were a great guard. So I loved, uh, Jerry West, um, Pete Maravich. Oscar. Yeah. Mar Maravich. You just thought he was fabulous because he could pass and do everything. Um, I just loved basketball. You know, I lived it. I practiced every day. You, you, you got to play in school. Um, you know, it's just, I think like everybody else, you, you sort of dream one day you'd play in the NBA other than you quickly find out you're six feet tall and you have no talent. Uh, so other than those little details, it gets kind of hard. Um, but, um, you know, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. How'd you get Drew Holiday? Um, so I think our, our general manager had been talking to the Pelicans for quite, <coughs> quite some time. At the time, Drew was probably um, everybody wanted him. You knew the Pelicans were going to trade him. So the question was, what are you willing to give up for him? And I think we gave up a lot. I mean, we did. It's, um, you know, for Drew, we gave up five draft picks. And that, you know, we decided to go all in. So we gave three first round draft picks. And so you do every other year because the NBA doesn't allow you to do it per year. And then we gave two swaps, which meant that if, you know, if we were out of 30 teams, if we were the 12th worst and the Pelicans were the 18th worst, they would have our pick. Right. If they were 12 and we were 18, they would have their pick. Right. So we keep right. ours. It's an interesting um, trade. I like that. Yeah. yeah. So it's, um, you know, did we give up a lot? Yes. And the hope was Drew was going to bring us over the top and that with Drew, we should be able to win. Um, it was a big decision because the GM recommended it. We spent a lot of time on it. Um, you know, the problem was if if it didn't work, you had just given up your future, right? Which is you know the future of the NBA or of your team is your draft picks. So we wouldn't be able to draft anybody. Um, and if it worked, it was great. And so the fact that it worked um, was a brilliant move. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but that's how everything is. Well, that's it. It's, they're always brilliant after the fact. We they both are. know that. That's or exactly. it's a disaster after the fact. You get tarred and feathered. Uh, the fans. Some remember the Milwaukee fans. Uh, I love these fans, by the way, because they remind me of Met fans. Okay, They're super passionate. They're locked into the team. Uh, you go to Milwaukee, they watch every minute of the game. They do. Mark, and they'll tell you every play and every foul and the bad ref call and so forth. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're fabulous. You know, the part that's funny is when um, – when you buy a team, uh, you know, everybody's, you're in Milwaukee. So imagine you're just in the stadium and people literally will come up to me and go, listen, um, I got a great idea. Here's who you got to trade for. And, you know, people come up to you and talk to you. And I remember one fan comes up to me and goes, listen, if you want to win in this league, here's the trade you got to do. I'm like, sure. What do you think we should do? He goes, you got to get LeBron and you got to get Steph Curry. Get those two guys, we're going to be good. I'm like, wow, whoa. You think so? <laughs> and, you know, and he goes, yeah, absolutely. No, trust me on this one. I'm like, okay, um, let me tell my GM. That's a great idea. I mean, it's, it, it's amazing the stuff you hear. 
I mean, it really is. It's. Uh, the, you have a, I, get, I get it. Do you have a Twitter account? No, I do not have a Twitter account. Our mutual, our mutual friend Steve Cohen yeah. confirmed yesterday that that's him on Twitter. Uh, so you don't tweet? I don't tweet. I don't do anything. I, I'm so scared of tweeting. Uh, so I don't I don't go on Twitter. Um, I feel it's easier. People will text me. Right. Yeah. I don't want the world knowing everything I'm doing. But yeah, I mean, I know you have one. I do. I do have a Twitter account. I'm somewhat. 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 Yeah, I use it a lot. During elections, I use it more. Actually. I know. I hey. So who doesn't? So let, let me let me ask you this. Uh, David Stern. Yeah. Um, went to school with one of his sons. I knew David, uh, the late, great David Stern. I knew him for many, many years. And when I was at Tufts, I went to see him at his office. I actually interviewed him for the Tufts Sports Spectrum. I was probably 20 years old. And he talked about the NBA. And he looked me straight in the face. It was 1983. He said, there will never be gambling in this sport. We will never have a franchise in Las Vegas. And we don't want people betting on these games in the United States. And here we are today, it's 2021. And tell us about that evolution and tell us how it's impacting the sport, if at all. Is it good for the sport? Is it bad for the sport? I think it's great for the sport. I mean, people love to gamble. They do, right? The fear was that in essence, you'd have issues with players. <coughs> Meaning that God forbid the player got hooked into a bad yeah. crowd and they threw a game or something like right. that. Right. And I, or, I don't think or that's, one of the coaches got yeah. yeah. And I think that I think that fear has gone away. I'm not saying it's not fully gone, but um you can bet now the over under on a quarter. You can bet, you know, while the person's at the free throw line, is he gonna make it? I mean, there's all these different things you can bet on. It's part of the game. I mean, people do it. Um, so I think part of what we want to do is there's is get involved in more and and sort of um get a benefit from that i think so i think that'll happen do i think a franchise will be in vegas i wouldn't see why not you know if you you know and, and, and you know the the nfl also said they wouldn't have a franchise right. in vegas and there you go and there so, you have one now so so there's been an explosion in franchise value and there's Companies like Dial Capital yep. that are trying to find ways to fractionalize and to allow people to have an owner experience in a smaller way, right. which will probably lead to higher valuations in I hope franchises. So. Yeah, and me too. Um, uh, but more so for you, obviously. Um, what, what do you think happens? We're five years from now. We're ten years from now. Look, I think valuations keep moving up because um, sports is one of the few things you can't record. I mean, you can record it, but it, it's, you know, we all have a phone. Um, some of you have two phones, <laughs> you, know, you have three phones. So imagine you record and you say, I want to see the game later on. Um, well, you got to put your phone away because you're, you're, yeah. you, you get automatic updates. Um, so I, I, I think that recording a sporting event is really hard. I mean, I'm not saying people don't do it, but it's got to be less than 1%. So it's the one thing you have to see live. It's the one thing you want to see live. Um, so it's a huge content that people want. And, you know, I would tell you our, our new contract comes up, our new media contract comes up. I assume it'll be higher than the previous one. Um, so I think you're just going to find valuations continuing to grow. Um, so uh, it should be good. So, you know, the, uh, the feeling of being handed the trophy. Describe that feeling. I was watching you on TV when you accepted that trophy. Tell us the feeling. I, I would tell you in the beginning, it's actually funny, there's this massive amount of relief because you're. it takes you so long so to get there. And then you finally get there, and then you've got jubil jubilation. You're thrilled. The hard part, um, I mean, for you, probably wouldn't have been a big deal. For me, um, as big a deal for me, you know, they give you the trophy and they tell you, you can only speak for 10 seconds. And you're like, Oh, I have so much to say. <laughs> <laughs> like and, to thank the Academy and my yeah. mom and dad. And you're on national TV. So you actually would like to say more than 10 or 15 seconds, but they're pretty strict about that. And then they go, we're going to give you the trophy. I'm like, great. And so I've never, I've never lifted it or I've never taken it. And you go and it's in this box. And you go to lifting, you realize, oh my God, it's heavy. 
Well, I saw it in your office. I, yeah, I gave it a lift. It, it's really heavy. And yeah. so now you got to lift it over your head, but you realize you haven't really worked out. Uh, so the one thing you don't want to ever do is drop. drop it. Oh, yeah. my God. I mean, could you imagine if I lift it up and it's like, uh, and then you drop it on national TV? It's, um, yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, so you, as I was lifting it, um, I'm like, oh, wow. So now you're going slow. And literally, you know, I get friends of mine text me. Place is going crazy. Yeah, and they're going, hey, look like you're having a hard time. Okay. <laughs> Lifting that thing up. I was like, yeah, it was fine. It's just heavy. Um, the funny part is after the game, after, after we win, you know, Giannis takes the trophy and um, he's got the MVP trophy and he's doing all the media things. So I go up to him. I'm like, hey, Giannis, I just want the trophy to take a couple of pictures. He goes, my trophy. <laughs> He goes, no. And um, so it's it, it's actually been a bit surreal. Um, it was actually the first time. I mean, imagine, you know, it's how many people watch this. Within a, I would say, a 24-hour period, I got a call from President Clinton saying congratulations, President Obama saying congratulations, and President Biden calling and saying congrats, and we want you to come to the White House to celebrate. Sure. Um, you know, it's very surreal. You get all these unknown numbers. <laughs> you don't know whether to pick yeah, them up or not. You're afraid to pick it up. Yeah, you're scared to pick it up. You're going to be punked or something. Right? Yeah, but that's, it was good. That's an apex moment. We all know that. But you're such a good guy, Mark. There had to be an apex moment for you with a person or a place or a charity over this odyssey of ownership that you just walked out of there and felt great. What was that? Oh, I would tell you it's um, a lot of it is you're you're doing all these engagements in Milwaukee where you're speaking and you quickly find out, you know, you talk about owning a team. You don't really own it. I mean, it's I, I think you're a custodian because you quickly find out the the passion and the love that people have. And so, you know, we bring we bring a bunch of the players to, you know, one of the hospitals in Milwaukee um, to help kids who have cancer and you, you sort of see that you're able to bring about a lot of change and you're trying to do things for the community and it it's really really cool i mean i know it's that's probably an overused word but you sort of find out that you can actually really effectuate change um and how passionate people are about sports and you know if you come with any of the players um it is amazing sort of the impact and you could see the impact we had on the city. I mean, you had literally 60, 70,000 people outside. Um, it really unified the city, brought people together. Um, I think like it's, it's been an incredible experience. And uh, congratulations again, your future. I watched the Michael Jordan ESPN doc. I know you watched it. You probably watched it twice and it's very hard to repeat. It's very hard to put the chemistry together. We're both statistics buffs. We know the, yeah. the averages. So what are we doing to get back there? Um, look, you're going to do everything you can. I think you, what you quickly find out, and I think it's the same in life, um, you've got to do a tremendous amount of hard work to get there. So I think, I think we're there. Then you've got to stay healthy. That's big. I think the chemistry on our team is pretty unique. Um, I think all the players know their roles. They know what they're doing. So I, and everybody gets a long exception. Well, we just had a team trip where we all went to Greece. Um, you know, the vast majority of the players went. Um, so I, I think we'll, if we stay healthy, we should hopefully get um, to the Eastern Conference Finals. And, you know, and then we'll see what happens. I mean, I think the teams we've got to obviously worry about is Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, Brooklyn is exceptionally talented. And then we'll see on the West, it'll probably be the Lakers, one of the other teams. But I think we have as good a shot as anybody. Um, but it's hard. You're, you're absolutely right. It's very hard. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Lasry, Avenue Capital, NBA championship owner of the Milwaukee Bucks. Thank you so much, Mark.